Thank you to these sponsors of the Before I Die New Mexico Virtual Festival in 2020. A good goodbye, Gail Rubin, puts the fun in funeral planning. After, a new way to stay connected with your loved ones in the cemetery anytime and anywhere. Aquamationinfo.com, where you can learn about alkaline hydrolysis and eco-friendly alternative to flame cremation. Compassion and Choices, offering care and choice at the end of life. Daniel's Family Funerals and Cremations and Gabaldon Mortuary in Albuquerque. Fairview Memorial Park and Vista Verde Memorial Park in Albuquerque and Rio Rancho. A Vista Cremation and Burial in Santa Fe. DeVargas Funeral Home and Crematory in Española and in Taos. Estate Pros, which offers personal dispersal of possessions due to a move, illness, or death. French Funerals and Cremations and Sunset Memorial Park in Albuquerque. And Keeper, which helps you keep memories alive with online tributes to preserve, celebrate, and share life legacies. Death is full of surprises, huh? You have no idea. of death and the coordinator of the Before I Die New Mexico Festival. Welcome to this panel discussion, funeral directors experiences in COVID hotspots. I am so pleased and honored to have with me here today, Amy Cunningham, who runs a fitting tribute funeral services in Brooklyn, New York, and Sid Waldman, Waldman Funeral Care in Houston, Texas. I've known Sid and Amy for a long time in, in the course of doing this death stuff. And um, I am uh, so glad to have their insights in this discussion about a very important topic as we are facing even more COVID infections and probably deaths coming. Um, here we are at the beginning of November. Who knows what November and December is going to bring. But uh, very glad to have your insights into this. Now, let's get started uh, just by um, Amy uh, and Sid. Why don't you tell us first how you got involved in the funeral business? Hi, everyone. Um, I was a 54-year-old uh, journalist and happily married mother of two uh, writing articles for magazines and blogging. Uh, for a website online when my father became ill and was in the care of hospice it was really his death and subsequent funeral that inspired me it was altogether a positive experience in, in, that sounds strange around an elderly man's death but it went about as well as it could have and uh, i felt that the funeral had um, expressed my father's values. And I decided to go back to school and become a licensed funeral director in my mid fifties. So um, uh, I stayed uh, at the firm that trained me for three years and then started my own little company here in Brooklyn, serving all of New York City. And I specialize in eco-friendly burials, uh, witnessed cremations and funerals in residences. If someone uh, is in the care of hospice and dies in a home, I bring dry ice to the house and have funerals the old fashioned way with the wake in the home. At least I was doing that prior to the coronavirus crisis. And Sid. I too uh, came to the funeral profession in uh, midlife, uh, 52. And um, before I was a funeral director, I was in IT. And for the last three years of that uh, stint, my job got sent to India. And I was pretty sure my wife was not going to transfer to India. Uh, so 
I went to Jewish family service here in Houston looking for a new career, not just a job, but a new career. And they suggested knowing me a funeral service and there was an opening with a Jewish funeral home here. Went to talk to them, got hired and immediately went to school. And that was 10 years ago uh, in December. I'll have been a graduate uh, funeral service mortuary school for 10 years. So I have uh, worked for the other two major funeral homes in Houston. And then in 2013, started Waldman Funeral Care. So Amy, we, well, certainly the COVID pandemic really took off in Seattle first. I wasn't able to get a Seattle funeral director to join us today. But um, what what did you experience in New York? It was so ironic, uh, everyone, because on the 6th of March, I flew to Atlanta, Georgia to be one of three mentors at a conference sponsored by the NFDA, which is the National Funeral Directors Association, the vast group, the trade group for all funeral directors in the United States. And I was one of three speakers about the future of the funeral, March 6th, 2020. And I presented all my photographs of green burials, natural work, chemical free funerals without any embalming. Uh, and uh, it was uh, a kind of a big day in my career. Um, uh, the coronavirus was in Seattle at that time. And I remember being apprehensive about the flight, but um, I came back to Brooklyn feeling victorious that the natural funeral was on the map and I was getting the attention I wanted. And wow, within uh, eight days, we were really, really slapped with uh, the coronavirus crisis. And then uh, had a little time, I think it was two weeks after that, uh, the deaths were reported and quickly coming in. I think one theory is that because New Yorkers travel uh, and rely on subway systems, people were passing the virus uh, on their commutes to and from work because the sheer volume uh, and the overwhelm at the hospital was um, an incredible thing. And a, I think a once in a career uh, event in the life of any funeral director. I have a couple of pictures of just how bad it got in New York that I can share. And, and of course you're just one of many funeral homes in New York City and that, um, you know, you weren't the only one that was getting swamped. Uh, mm -hmm. but, yeah. Uh, that's right. And I, I should clarify, Gail, that I have a small firm. And when you're a funeral director in a big city like New York, um, you can't afford a $13 million building. I'll be curious how it works in Houston. Uh, so we partner with each other. So as a, a small firm, uh, I pay rent at an existing funeral home in Brooklyn. And this is what our chapel looked like uh, by the end of March. Uh, this is horrifying, I'm sure, to many of you, but um, to a funeral director, outside of the strange little Dixie cup there on top of the uh, cardboard casket, um, this is organized chaos, it truly is. These are deceased people in caskets or caskets recently delivered and um, everyone is identified, the deceased people are covered. And this was a masterful thing to pull together with that, with a funeral firm that was really used to holding perhaps 10 people at a time was now suddenly holding nearly a hundred. We so, brought in coolers and trailers to keep people cool. Wow. So I, I see some, what look like bodies and body bags toward the wall. That's true. And, um, you know, and are there bodies in those caskets? Some of them, I think, with the paper on top, have just recently been delivered, but they're all waiting to uh, for the funeral date. And that was another thing that happened. Uh, within two weeks of all of the deaths, the cemeteries and the crematories, uh, and this happened in Houston too, I understand it from Sid, that there were delays 
uh, in getting deceased people to cemeteries and crematories in a timely way. So we were holding people much longer than we were used to. Um, but I was proud um, to be affiliated with this group. Um, this is Chris, my colleague, and here he is very competently uh, taking care of his own health and keeping his mask on and, and attending to all the cases that we suddenly had. So it was overwhelming. And as, a, as someone who was um, in, engaged in the enterprise of making people more comfortable with deceased bodies, you know, my teaching prior to this moment had been all about, yes, you can hang out in the house a few hours after your grandmother's death and put flowers on the bed, put music on, have a ceremony. Um, uh, I was also uh, showing people that natural burial with a, a, a deceased person wrapped only in fabric and laid on a beautiful piece of lumber or board uh, to keep that body um, straight and rigid as it was lowered into the grave that all of these magnificent sort of natural possibilities were available uh, to families. Um, suddenly, I felt almost like I might have to go out of business in a way temporarily because I felt like I really had very little to offer. I'll let Sid talk a little bit about his experience and then I'll show you some of my solutions because I ultimately worked it out, I think in a pretty satisfactory way, but there was definitely a crisis moment where I felt as a funeral director, uh, working without chemicals and uh, offering people new opportunities to memorialize their loved one that I that I, I was really stumped for a moment there in March and early April. We had a lot of cases in the community at large. Um, and I work with funeral homes um, and saw a lot of COVID cases in those three months. Um, I was working nearly every day for other funeral homes, plus working at my own funeral home. For us in the, uh, the Jewish funeral rites, there is um, uh, certain things that we do to prepare the body. And because that involved people coming into the funeral home uh, as a committee to wash and dress and casket the body, um, based on medical advice and the National Heber Kadisha Association, uh, we stopped that. Um, we were not afraid of having the decedent uh, pass the COVID virus to the living members of the Heber Kadisha, but we were afraid of asymptomatic Heber Kadisha members passing it amongst the, the four or six people on the team who was doing the washing and dressing. So we had to, for a while, stop that. Um, our funerals went from as many as you wanted at gravesite to only 10, including the clergy and the funeral director. We immediately went and started to look at live streaming and to find a way to live stream at a cemetery remembering that a cemetery has no power, has no Wi-Fi, and obviously no cameras. So we had to um, figure out the process in which we were going to do that. We bought a tablet, we bought a hotspot, and we began to use Zoom as our live streaming medium directly from uh, the cemetery because both of those things had long lasting batteries. And so a funeral of eight family members plus as many as they wanted on Zoom is how we got through the worst of the pandemic. Now, one other thing to mention was we literally had no PPE and couldn't even find at first the basics. Um, that has all eased considerably now. And we have gloves and gowns and paper face masks and plastic face shields 
so that the Heber Kedisha has now been able to come back into the funeral home, do the necessary religious rites, and do it safely so they don't spread the virus amongst each other. But we are waiting because a third wave or second wave is coming. It's very bad in El Paso, which is just a thousand miles from us and is expected to be in Houston within the next two to three weeks with a dramatic rise in cases. It's getting scary out there. Yeah, Amy. I have a question for you, Sid. Um, was sure. your funeral home like ours in that there was not enough science initially on the risk of catching the uh, coronavirus from a deceased person or maybe I think we resolved and learned that the greater risk was from family members wanting to attend the funeral when they'd ex been exposed to the virus. How did you handle all that? So what we did is we went immediately to the CDC and the Hever Kadisha National Organization. And <clears throat> between the two of them, what we did was, um, uh, we used cotton and we packed the mouth and the nostrils with cotton and um, uh, disc spray, which is a heavy duty anti, uh, antiseptic, antiviral uh, fluid. And then after the washing and the dressing, we removed that. So that helped, um, uh, it was basically a face mask, if you will, for the decedent, but while we, so that if there was any air expulsion out of the decedent while we were washing or dressing them, which can happen, um, we weren't going to be exposed to any potential COVID virus. So um, we continue to use that actually as a basic method for all of our decedents, because we think of all of them as having COVID, whether they did or didn't, we assume they did right now. And that way, all the same protocols happen for everyone. I know here in Albuquerque, I'm on the Heber Kadisha, which would do the washing and the dressing of the body. They suspended us doing any of that and we haven't restarted. Um, and I don't know when we will restart, which is, Kind of sad, but um, you know, it's it's for everybody's health of the living people um, as opposed to the dead. Yeah. So it's interesting because in many communities in this country now, the Hever Kadisha has been suspended, such as in Albuquerque, but they're doing it virtually. So a Hever Kadisha member will be in their home. There will be a um, audio or audio and video link to the funeral home and the funeral director. They will watch each other and they will say the prayers as the funeral director is washing and dressing the decedent. So the funeral director is the only one in an exposed position, if you will, but the rites and the ceremony is still being completed, which makes the family very happy. Mm -hmm. That's great. Well, and Amy, there's there's a very large, of course, Orthodox Jewish population in Brooklyn. Um, what are you seeing in regard to them? I, my understanding is, I mean, they're they're getting some super spreading there among their community. I can't speak to, with a lot of authority to that, but I know that that particular community has. Um, been in connection with the mayor and uh, uh, trying now to more strongly abide by the city's suggestions. You know, for a long time, I think uh, that particular community wanted to carry on with important rituals as they had been. Mm -hmm. uh, so it took a, t a time for everyone in New York to become educated and to, you know, when you're speaking to someone who hasn't been able to say goodbye in the hospital when they bid farewell on a cell phone. Uh, they're wanting to verify that that is indeed their uh, father 
or mother in the casket and they're very frightened and um, uh, wanting a ritual uh, to manage and families weren't able to travel to be together. So there were so many layers of sadness uh, in the face of this uh, that it was hard for all of us to cope. And funeral directors generally uh, want to be able to grant requests uh, from the family members they serve. So it was really hard for all of us to say, no, you can't, we're so sorry, you can't do that. Or only one, there was one phase where a cemetery was only allowing one family member to be present um, and at a distance from the grave workers at any burial. If the second family member had to drive the car, they had to stay in the car. So it was, it was really bad for a while. We're in the business of providing comfort to families and, and doing this sacred work. And in so many small and large ways, there were impediments put up to doing that. And we had to find ways to continue our work, albeit differently, but to still provide for that um, the the funeral ritual and the the safety of all concerned while providing that compassionate care mm -hmm. um even though we couldn't hug or we okay. couldn't shake hands mm -hmm. but um and then there was the mask so you couldn't see the smile and so you know i took to just doing a, sort of the japanese bow to show my respect to these families and try to convey my sorrow and condolences without a without a hug without a handshake um without a close-up i'm sorry because we kept our distance too yeah um so i'd like to encourage our participants on this meeting if you have questions type them in the chat and i will share them but amy you've got some photos of how you were able to still provide the kind of service that you provide even with the COVID. Um, yes, uh, I can share my screen in a moment and show you what I feel is a successful funeral service at the height of the crisis. And recall that um, uh, I, well, I'll just show you the pictures. Um, It was just a tough time. <laughs> this is kind of bringing it back. I quickly posted to my website uh, that I would be offering services on Zoom, even though I didn't know anything about Zoom. And um, I had to learn. And Zoom has surprised us all. Here we are on Zoom right now. Um, and. Uh, uh, there are some, some great things about it. Instead of sitting in rows facing forward, we're facing each other, um, which is a nice thing. So um, a family called me in April. Uh, this daughter um, uh, called to say that her mother uh, had uh, gotten the virus in her assisted living uh, residence and they were very fearful. They didn't know what was going to happen, but that she was incredibly ill. Uh, they uh, helped uh, me uh, fill out some documents in advance. And about 10 days later, sure enough, this dear lady whose name is Winifred Pardo, may she rest in peace, uh, she did die and um, I was in charge of her burial. Now, at that moment here in New York City, all the flower markets, even the wholesale flower mart um, in lower Manhattan was completely closed. We were just shut down as a city and everybody was at home. So I didn't have any flowers for this woman's burial. And the family decided, I think wisely, also not to come. So it was almost what we call a direct burial with, um, with just me present and the grave workers. Um, I had an assistant 
and we ended up uh, uh, managing this burial through Zoom. But because I didn't have any flowers, uh, my own block here in Brooklyn has a block association and a newsletter. And I put out in the neighborhood, hey guys, you know I'm a funeral director. Uh, I don't have any flowers for this burial on Wednesday. Do you think you could find things in your yard to cut and bring to me? Well, here were all my neighbors just desperately sad in their own homes, managing the crisis in their own way, just trying to get their own groceries. And um, people just went nuts over this idea of assisting a stranger with a funeral service. Um, so here are my neighbors cutting lilacs, which were in peak season. And a larger point, I remember now the point I wanted to make earlier, I think if I hadn't been a holistic type interested in empowering families to do some things for themselves at the time of a death, bathing the body, you know, um, staying in the home, um, uh, carrying the casket, all of that training in home funeral and progressive alternative funeral service guided me through this moment. And by enlisting my own neighbors to get involved, it kind of made for a, a, a synergistic kind of um, blessed, blessed moment. Um, I also had a name plate for the particular casket that the Pardo family had chosen. And ordinarily, I would take that nameplate to a machine embroidery shop here uh, in Brooklyn, but they weren't open. So uh, within the neighborhood um, Yahoo group, I said, um, does anyone embroider? And within four minutes of posting that, uh, this lovely woman who I'd never met, who lives two blocks from me, said, of course, I'd love to embroider the nameplate. So and I said, well, listen, I can pay you. And she said, are you kidding? I'm not gonna charge you. So here's this lovely nameplate that was embroidered for the casket. So now I, I had a day to go before the burial. I had the nameplate and the flowers. And there we are on the morning um, of uh, the funeral service, uh, putting the nameplate on this very pretty white wool uh, biodegradable fabric casket. And there are my colleagues, my beautiful colleagues uh, from the funeral firm. Off we went to the cemetery and there are all the neighborhood flowers at the burial. So as I said, if I hadn't been helping families in creative ways previously, I don't think I would have had the wherewithal to have assembled this. And with my assistant holding uh, her telephone, uh, we Zoomed the service safely to the family that was spread out in different states. And so they were able to watch the burial on Zoom. That's beautiful. Zoom has been such a wonderful um, piece of technology during this time. Um, and will continue to be afterwards. We are not going to give up Zoom funerals. We're going to have them from now on because people from Israel and Taiwan and Czechoslovakia and Hawaii and all the 50 states and Canada can all come together and view a funeral, which is exactly what happened with one of mine. Mm -hmm. And um, none of those people probably would have traveled. They wouldn't have had the experience of seeing the funeral and being part of the family support. And so this is, um, this is how we're making a difference now. And we don't just um, have the cameras on during the funeral, uh, the burial at the graveside. We let it continue to run all the time that the casket is being, the grave is being filled in, it's about 20 minutes done by hand. And we open the video and the microphones up for all the participants so they can talk to each other and have some community time. And I know that there are some of those family people who haven't spoken together in 20 years because they're all over the world. 
and yet they are able to come together and have a few minutes together um, in this way. And the families themselves are now doing Zoom shivits, which mm -hmm. is the the meetings afterwards where would normally have been at a home and you would have had a small ritual service and maybe some light noshes and people would have gathered around the family to provide support. Well, there is no gatherings at home. I mean, Thanksgiving is canceled, but the shivas are being done by Zoom. And so people all around the world are coming together and supporting these families using this technology. It's so, a silver lining in a, in a terrible pandemic. Yeah, the funeral business is notoriously resistant to change and the technology has been there. I mean, I wrote about it in A Good Goodbye when it first came out 10 years ago about streaming funeral services, but it was few and far between the funeral homes that were using this technology. And now everybody's got to use it and suddenly they're stepping up. So, but broadband so has also helped. I mean, high speed internet. Yeah, yeah. Um, so what other silver light linings or lessons learned do you think have come out of this pandemic for funeral directors? I think a big one is that we were putting so much emphasis on the 90 minute gathering with eulogies delivered from the podium and music either live or cued, all those lovely things, which, um, which were great in their hour um, are less possible now, but out of adversity, wisdom springs. And we see now the funeral as a sequence of experiences. We had put so much emphasis on that 180 minute event that I think we neglected other moments in the grief cycle, if you will, um, uh, the transfer from the place of death, or even uh, an important one is the delivery uh, or presentation of cremated remains. After a cremation, a funeral director will somehow get those remains to you. And um, that's a moment for ceremony, virtual or real. Um, and, um, we're allowed now to experiment and see other opportunities uh, uh, where uh, people in the grieving experience, where people can process this loss in an ongoing way. You know, uh, I think we, we're talking about closure. Everybody says they want closure after a major death. Well, closure turned out to be kind of a mirage. Um, when we have a significant loss in our lives, we're processing that really for the rest of our lives. And I don't mean that to be a big downer, but um, the, anyone uh, sophisticated in the navigation uh, of, of death knows that uh, a year later, you're still having um, uh, welling up with tears. And so now we've widened the definition of what a funeral is. I think also, um... Amy, I, that, that's wonderful, and it's it is so true. Um, we never did slideshows before COVID, because how do you do a slideshow in a cemetery next to a grave? It's not possible. So, um, but with Zoom, it is possible. You pre-produce the slideshow and you have it run right before the graveside service or right after the graveside service it becomes part of the official recording of the funeral and then we take those recordings and we edit them just a little bit the front and the end and we put them on our youtube channel and put a link on the obituary page so others who couldn't be at the funeral that day can see it within a few days. But that slideshow now gets tacked on at the end and is a very meaningful part of the total because these people haven't seen some of these photos ever. And yet they're their loved ones and they have great meaning for them. And um, so that's one way that 
we're adding to the experience. The other is because we can't meet in person and we're a very personalized um, funeral service provider. We're doing e-document signatures now so that it's very easy for anyone to sign a form, whether it's on their uh, tablet or on their cell phone or even on a PC. And, and that limitation um, where before we would send it to them by email, they would have to print it out, sign it, scan it, send it back, all that is gone away. And, um, you know, with a lot of families who are pretty technology rich now, um, this makes it a lot easier. And it's certainly easier on us because we get a response back within minutes rather than within hours. Well, that and uh, the whole idea of planning ahead, um, mm -hmm. you know, this whole sense of our mortality hovering over our heads. Um, have, have you seen more people being willing to talk about and pre-plan for their own funerals? Yeah. Big yes. Um, lots of phone calls, lots of giving me lots of paperwork to catch up on because um, there are a lot of forms to fill out on any pre-arrangement, but absolutely. Uh, death educators like you, Gail, used to kind of have to work hard to convince people to talk about death. Now death is so front and center, um, like it or not, it's sad, but it's in the newspaper every day and it has really gotten people uh, activated, uh, not only to plan for their own demise, but to live life uh, uh, consciously and with death uh, in the not too distant background somehow. I think people are, um, saying what they want to say to their family members and loving each other uh, to a more uh, conscious degree. I don't know, but, uh, everyone's different in their re response to this, but wow, we'll be looking back on this time uh, decades from now and, and, and seeing some great changes, I hope. Yeah. I think America is finally uh, pulling their head out of the sand and beginning to think about death as um, a part of life. I mean, yes. everyone is on that journey. And I think that COVID has certainly brought that to the forefront. I mean, even yesterday, there were more than a thousand deaths just due to COVID in this country. When you start thinking about that, that's 30 to 40,000 deaths every month. And that's a that's a lot of people who are dying from one particular disease, not taking into account all the other deaths that happen in America on an everyday basis, from old age to traffic accidents, unfortunately to suicides and other ways of, of, um, of dying. So um, I think that Americans are finally beginning to think about it. I think the... Um, the people who are calling me to prearrange are not the old. They're the next generation down. They're not only planning for their parents, but they're planning for themselves because they don't want the burden on their children. First of all, they know their children have no savings. They are full up on their credit cards to the max. So they have to figure out a way to provide for their own funeral and their own wishes. And the kids may not necessarily think about doing things the same way as the parents want done. So there's a, um, there's a religious and traditional gap there, I think that we're seeing so that the parents are writing things down and making sure their wishes are known and paying for it so that the kids don't have to. And then what I hear from them is, is after it's all done, they say this huge weight is now off my shoulders. I'm not carrying around that big ape anymore. It's gone. Mm -hmm. And that makes me be able to live the rest of my life for you. I know what's gonna happen to me. I'm good with it. Another thing that's been really nice is that families have been writing letters to their deceased loved ones 
and giving them to me to put inside the casket or uh, taping to the outside of the casket. And um, we're exploring other ways to connect and get things said and um, love represented. Um, so that's been um, a powerful part of a lot of cremation ceremonies is the decorating of that empty box. Uh, if they can't see the deceased person, they can decorate that casket and make it theirs. And um, those kinds of services have been going really, really surprisingly well. Hey, Gail. Yes. Uh, this is Bob Hoffman in Washington, DC. Can I ask two questions of our friends? You bet. And, yeah. and, and, my, and my compliments on the way you're handling this whole thing. It's uh, a time for creativity and you guys both seem to be doing very well at that. Uh, two questions. One is one of Gail's um, panelists is a guy, I don't know him, but he's from Brooklyn and his firm is called AFTA. Uh, and it's since you're talking so much about technology, I, and I want to know if you had any experience with it because he puts a camera at the gravesite and it's a virtual way to for others to view what's going on at the gravesite. I was wondering if you had any experience with that. And secondly, since I'm going to ask second question, is the new uh, aquamation or the uh, uh, hydrolysis process, have you had any experience with that for cremation? Thank you, Hoff. I think that camera uh, thing is a really interesting uh, cutting edge uh, product and I haven't had any direct experience with it, but I think it's a, a, a good idea and another way uh, to have a comforting presence after a death. Aquamation is not legal in New York. Uh, Sid, do you have it in Texas? No, it's not legal yet, but we're show, hoping that the new legislature, which will open up on January 20th or so, will pass a bill as they did two years ago, but this time the governor will actually sign it rather than veto it. Hope so, yeah, the aquamationinfo.com website uh, is a good place to check for what, where it's available in which states. Yes, and it's possible that the coronavirus crisis will accelerate uh, the improvements uh, in what funeral directors have been able to offer and perhaps even drive um, uh, folks into an eco-friendly direction that would have taken more time uh, to get to. We're really hoping for acclimation. Uh, for myself, it will be uh, a potentially more viable option than flame cremation um, for the families that I serve. Um, if there weren't the flame, I think there would be a lot less resistance to uh, water-based cremation. Mm -hmm. And natural organic recomposition is just launching in Washington state this month. We'll see how that goes and hope it might come to other states. But it's, it, it's about five years behind aquamation it'll, at it'll least. It'll take some time. Uh, but in, in addition, uh, we do have videos on the website. On, we have a video page and in the playlist for the festival, we do have a Q&A about aquamation with uh, Laura Sussman, who has a funeral home in Las Vegas, Nevada. And, um, and they actually serve a lot of Jewish families. And um, yeah, they do find that water-based element to be very approachable as mm -hmm. opposed to the flame-based. Mm -hmm. Another thing that was nice in New York is that um, funeral directors who had been competing against each other cultivated a collegial um, relationship that was sort of new and everybody just wanted to help everyone else. And, and uh, so that was lovely to see that we know each other better and appreciate each other. And all, I was just uniformly impressed with how hard funeral directors work and how much they wanted to do. Um, 
uh, no one was backing off this. Uh, we were really working to find creative solutions as quickly as we could. While staying safe and while keeping the families and exactly. those other uh, participants safe as well. Yep. And um, we all witnessed a lot of heart heartbreak during this, this time and it can't help but change all of us, the mm -hmm. families, the other participants in the services and all the funeral directors, um, all of us, it changes our hearts. Yes. Well, and it only looks like the challenges are going to get steeper as we go into the fall and winter months here. Yeah. Um, do you have any, any closing thoughts about hmm. funeral service business and uh, in light of what we're facing with COVID? So I have a question for Amy, because you live in New York and I you grew up there and I know it gets cold in New York in the winter time. Mm -hmm. And so do you think that you'll have a larger lag in the cemeteries because it will take them longer to dig uh, grave sites um, than they can in the, in the summertime? Will that impose greater problems for you this winter? That's a great question. I haven't noticed New Yorkers, um, ref cemeteries refusing to dig in cold weather. Uh, I think they have heating blankets. Uh, in Vermont and New Hampshire, the scene is a little different. Um, but what I thought you were gonna ask is the uh, hardship entailed in having outdoor services since we're not indoor chapel, uh, it, having those services inside that we were, um, I think we are gonna need to bundle up and stay outside. Um, I know even restaurants here in New York are thinking of winter dining out of doors and how to bring in heating unit, units and such. And I've been tempted to research those. They have big torches uh, that you can heat spaces with. I don't know how that will translate with the funeral, but. I think we'll be in heavy winter coats and I was just going to Google search for hand warmers so I could provide families with things to put inside their mittens if we're gonna have these outdoor services as we have been. Uh, again, there's something about standing out in the snow that's very beautiful to say goodbye to your loved one. Um, and folks I know will do whatever it takes to, to have that moment. To have buried both parents in Long Island in the middle of February, different decades, but still exceedingly cold. My father's uh, funeral day temperature was right about zero, and mm -hmm. but it was a sunny day, so you felt warmer, but it was cold. And so I understand uh, we didn't have a tent or chairs. We all just dressed for it as yeah. best as we could. And um, it does make it a, a challenge. It'll, you know, for us in Houston, we don't have the cold, but we get lots of rain in the mm -hmm. wintertime. That's where, that's our rainy season. Yeah. And so cold, like in the low 40s and rain, actually I think is more miserable than zero degrees in sun. <laughs> yeah. I think yeah. people are proud of themselves when they get through a, a tough time like that and look back on it. It seals the memory in a powerful way, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It'd be interesting to see also how people live stream in that extreme cold right. because the equipment is not made for, you know, that kind of those kinds of temperatures. Yeah. Yeah, I think some reinvention uh, will uh, be called for and continue as we go through this next season. And Gail will have to call us back and interview us again. Yes, yes. In the spring. <laughs> Fingers crossed that um, things get better uh, because it's looking very dark right now. But um, Amy, Cunningham, Sid Waldman, thank you so much for your insights and 
taking the time to participate in this very important discussion and uh, great insights. And uh, I hope you all continue to stay safe and um, continue to serve the excellent way that I know you serve. And uh, Be healthy. Thank you. Thank you for all your work, Gail. You're amazing. Thank you. Thank Steve. you. Thank you, Amy. Yeah. Pleasure.